I've been watching your videos covering hypertension, blood pressure, concerning the medication hydrochlorothiazide and depletion of zinc and volume. My prescription medication goes like this. It's a combo, lisinopril and hydrochlorothiazide. That's one of the most popular combinations, by the way, um, an ACE inhibitor and anadiuretic. I'm going to bring up angiotensin as a better uh, medication replacement for hydrochlorothiazide to better my concern dealing with sexual health and prostate. Do you have any other suggestions about the combo prescription? Now, one thing I want to make clear here is that angiotensin and lisinopril are basically going to be the same thing. So you're not really substituting one class for another when it comes to hypertension. And so when I got this question, I thought, well, there's so many different ways that I can approach answering it, but I figured the best, most useful way to use our time and our resources is to talk about the four things that seems to really impact blood pressure in a way that we can test for sometimes and in other ways we can't. But at the end of the day, there are little small tweaks that you can do in your own day-to-day -day life whether it be a supplement or a vitamin or just a lifestyle change that can yield huge difference. Because when he's on um, just a, such a low amount of blood pressure medicine, what it tells me is that maybe we could potentially get him off of blood pressure medicine. So the first thing that I will want him to do and you to do is make sure that your vitamin D levels are optimized. Now, for the past 25 years or so, they have equated low vitamin D or di di vitamin D deficiency with hypertension. But study after study is having a hard time proving that it actually causes hypertension. But what we are 100% sure of, and the resources are below, is that if you happen to be low in vitamin D and hypertensive, that Elevating your vitamin D levels can help decrease your hypertension and your high blood pressure, right? So this happens in a number of ways. One, I want you to one, test your vitamin D levels, right? So when they test vitamin D, they might tell you your insurance doesn't cover that test, oddly enough. But you can actually get your vitamin D levels checked out of pocket for anywhere between 30 to 70 bucks, depending on what lab you're going to. So insist on it. Say, well, you know what? If you can't, if the insurance won't cover it, you know, I'll pay for it myself, right? Get your vitamin D levels. For me, I like for vitamin D to be optimized somewhere between 60 and 90, right? And it takes an awful lot a time to get it up to there. As a matter of fact, when I first tested my vitamin D levels, it was 14. That's how low my vitamin D levels are. And vitamin D tends to be lower in people who are browner skin, browner complexion, because it is difficult to convert vitamin D to its usable form because we need sun rays to do that. And this beautiful melanin sometimes blocks that, right? So one thing I want you to do is get your vitamin D levels checked. If it is low, then you need to start considering how to optimize and increase vitamin D. For most of my uh, patients, it's vitamin D3 with K2 in it. And the K2 helps make sure that the vitamin D levels in high, in, in high supplements, you know, in, in like 10,000 units or 5,000 units, won't cause calcification or hardened arteries, right? So the vitamin K2 helps make sure that those high levels of vitamin D don't, don't do the opposite of what we want, which is harden the blood vessels, right? So one thing about vitamin D supplementation is you got to make sure it's working. So many of us take the vitamin D and then just assume it's working. Take a thousand milligrams a day, assume it's working, which in most people is way too low. Usually the dose is at least 2,500 to 5,000 IUs a day. And then what you want to do is check again in a few months to make sure it's going up. Because if it's not going up, now we have to figure out why is it not being absorbed and where is that vitamin D going if it's not going to increase it. So what you'll likely see is that it increased it some. And then what you may need to do is um, up the dose to continue to increase it more. Because actually when they're looking at data, it shows that we don't, you don't see any improvements in the blood pressure necessarily when it's high mega doses of vitamin D, you see the improvement in the blood pressure off of kind of chronic, you know, uh, lower doses just over time, right? So 
One, I want you to look at your vitamin D levels. <clears throat> the next thing I want you to do is consider that you may have a magnesium deficiency or your body isn't able to use magnesium in the way that it should, right? Those are, those are two separate things, but they're really signaling the same thing. Um, and I've got resources below to kind of help you understand that when it comes to magnesium, you know, not only is it involved in like 300 cellular processes throughout the body, it is so important when it comes to vasodilatation, which is basically the blood vessels relaxing so that blood, blood flow can improve. Because when you have hypertension, what's happening is those blood vessels are constricting and going tight. And then the blood flow going through it is having a hard time. So what you want is vasodilatation. You want those blood vessels to relax. And what magnesium does is it kind of helps in that process. So magnesium is a natural calcium channel blocker. So some of you may be on Norvask or Amlodipine or, or, um, you know, isosorbide. So all, both of the, all that's uh, calcium channel blockers. Well, magnesium blocks the calcium channels naturally. It helps increase nitric oxide production and it improves endothelial cell dysfunction, right? So if you've gone to myedquiz.com and you've taken the quiz, you may have been diagnosed or, you know, suggested that you have endothelial cell dysfunction. And what the endothelial cells do is they line the blood vessels and they're responsible for whether or not the blood vessels are going to clamp down or open up, right? And when it comes to erectile function, you want them open up. When it comes to hypertension and, and your heart health, you want them to open up, right? And so we need nitric oxide to be able to do that. Um, and magnesium can help actually boost nitric oxide production. So it helps also improve endothelial cells health. It makes them healthier so that your blood vessels can actually do what they're supposed to do, which is expand when they need to and constrict when they need to, right? So the other thing that magnesium actually does, it is integral in the process of vasodilatation. So not only does it help facilitate nitric oxide production, it, it helps repair the, the lining of the blood vessels and it helps relax blood vessels. So magnesium is so important for so many different reasons, but particularly when it comes to blood pressure issues. Now, so there's a couple different ways we can approach blood pressure issues. We can do some genetic testing and see if you have certain SNPs that might make it hard for you to, to uh, process magnesium, might make it difficult for you to make nitric oxide, or we can assume that you have those issues and, and give you some uh, magnesium in order to make those improvements, right? So of course, then you're like, well, doc, which types of magnesium? Now, when you're looking at the bottle, magnesium is always conjugated to something else like magnesium stearate, magnesium glycinate, magnesium taurate, magnesium laurate, magnesium citrate. So um, if, you're take, if you happen to be taking arginine, L-arginine, and you're not listening to me, then make sure that it has magnesium citrate in it because that'll help protect you. Um, if you're, you know, taking it in the evening time and you want to relax, maybe a little constipated, take magnesium glycinate. If you are feeling like you're achy and you have arthritis and maybe a little fibromyalgia, you're having energy levels, then we're thinking about magnesium malate, right? So, and then of course, if you are um, older and you feel like you're having some memory issues, trouble concentrating, then you would do magnesium taurate, right? So magnesium is amazing for so many different reasons, but magnesium has a huge impact on hypertension. So vitamin D, We've got magnesium. These are the two things that you want to look at. And then the third thing is going to be nitric oxide levels. Remember, and, and, and click below if you want more information because we've got plenty of studies to show you this information. Remember that nitric oxide used to be called the endothelium derived relaxing factor. And really all that means is it's in the lining of the blood vessel and it causes those blood vessels to relax. Unfortunately, the diuretics, the things that we normally use to treat hypertension first line helps destroy your ability to make that nitric oxide. And so you're not relaxing blood vessels as much as, as you could. And so your blood pressure elevates and eventually erectile function is the next thing um, to, to, to 
notice an impact on you. Say, oh, I'm not getting as stiff as I used to. Oh, it's just not like it used to be. Oh, I'm getting older. Well, no, not necessarily that you are getting older, but your blood vessels are aging. And so one thing we have to think about is how can we boost nitric oxide levels, right? And we talk about that all the time, whether it's the green leafy vegetables, whether it's the beetroot extract, whether it's the smoothie recipes, the E-function smoothie recipes, whether it is a clinically proven strategy like a, a, a medical food or a medical supplement that has a nitrate in it, right? So of course I have a link to my favorite nitrate, nitrate based supplement below. Nitrates have gotten a bad rap in the media. Um, most of that information that you're reading about nitrates is antiquated, it's played out. If nitrates were bad for you, um, we would see people who eat a ton of vegetables always having some form of cancer or something like that, right? It's just not true. Nitrates can really help turn the thing around. And then the other thing, you know, we spend so much time on salt. You go to the doctor, yeah, your pressure's a little high, cut down on salt. Cut the salt, cut the salt, cut the salt. When, when in reality, when we re really look at the data and the studies, it shows that got people who have low salt intake, they really don't live as long as people who have moderate levels of salt intake. And then when we also look at heart disease and hypertension, and we go back and we look at salt intake through the years, when we go back a hundred years per se, when people's salt intake was about kind of like it is now, they did, still didn't have all the same health problems that we have. Honestly, I think that sugar has the biggest impact. There's plenty of data to suggest that in the average individual, if we can cut about two to three tablespoons, or I'm sorry, teaspoons of sugar from your diet on a daily basis, you'll start to see your blood pressure levels go down. So, you know, you don't have to ignore your doctor when they say cut the salt, cut the salt, cut the salt. You know, because what we're really saying when we say cut the salt is we're saying cut down on the processed food. But the main thing that processed food has on top of having like some monosodium glycerate or some fake salt in it is it is high in sugar content. So if you really focus on cutting back on the sugar, cutting down your grams, I mean, look, look sugar is hidden everywhere. It is in your, in your tomato sauce. It is in your uh, ketchup. It's in your juice in the morning. You know, sugar is everywhere. Um, in processed food, they add extra layers of sugar just to make the stuff taste really good. So instead of um, just picking up your favorite items and continuing to fill your kitchen with the stuff that you've always cooked with, I want you to really start looking at those tables um, on the back and look at the added sugar. Try to cut out the added sugar and you'd be surprised at what cutting back sugar will do and the impact that it will have on your blood pressure, right? Because it's the sugar, the fructose, that's really having a major impact on our blood vessels. And when we look at why that is, it really has a lot to do with inflammation and the inflammatory cascade. Not only does sugar uh, fuel a lot of terrible processes in our body, but it makes us more insulin dependent. It makes us gain weight. It elevates your blood pressure. It reduces nitric oxide levels, and it is kind of a poison, you know, added sugar, right? Now the sugar in fruit comes buffered with fiber, right? This is why we do smoothies instead of juicing is because the fiber in the fruit helps offset the impact that the sugar would have. When you're taking processed sugar and giving it to somebody, there's no added fiber in there to buffer it. And that sugar is usually artificial. It's not cane sugar. It's not from the earth. It's not honey. It's not anything natural. It's really just pr produced by sugar beets in some factory somewhere and given to us in high fructose corn syrup, right? So just to kind of reiterate where we're going with this, when it comes to your blood pressure, let me put, put it up on the screen because I think I made a little slide that would show you the four things that we just talked about. Oh, here we go. So in order to start to fix your high blood pressure so that you can reduce and eventually be off of high blood pressure medicine, look at your vitamin D levels. Think about supplementing magnesium. Um, you know, five to 600 milligrams, sometimes even more than that, 1,200 milligrams in certain people a day. 
right? Make sure that your nitric oxide levels are being optimized and you're not doing anything to impair nitric oxide production. You're not taking Prilosec and Omeprazole and Protonix and all of that every single day of your life, right? You're, you're not using mouthwash to deplete your nitric oxide levels. You are making sure that you're very balanced bacteria-wise so that you can make the nitric oxide properly. And then, of course, shutting down and, and, and decreasing your sugar intake, being very mindful of the amount of sugar that you are taking in, because to be honest, nobody's ever going to blame it on sugar because there's too much money in the sugar industry. Okay. So, um, they will mention it and tell you to cut down on it. And, you know, and still they, they, the, the, the recommendations as to how much sugar you should be having every day is still, in my opinion, very high when it comes to added sugars. So, Cut back on the sugars, cut back on the juices, cut back on the, on the sodas. Look at your condiment packages, look at your sauces, look at everything you're cooking with and everything you're buying and putting in your body. Cut that sugar down. Look at all these other things and message me when you start to notice your blood pressure is coming down. I am so serious. All right. So that was a great question. 